Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me for this, for giving this talk. Okay, so I'll talk about the Target A trial, going over the 18-year journey between 1994 to 2012, where we have tried to move from a one-size-fits-all whole breast radiotherapy to a more individualized approach of risk-adjusted radiotherapy. This required a conceptual leap, a technological leap, phase two trials, randomized trials, some mathematical modeling, and translational research. So you have breast cancer. This is what I used to tell patients in early 1990s in Tata Hospital in Mumbai. And then the next question was, can you travel to the hospital every day for six weeks? And if the answer was yes, I would tell her we can preserve your breast, and if it was no, we would have to do a mastectomy because they would have to have radiotherapy for six weeks. Now that was in 1990s in Bombay, but it, I'm told by Dr. Michael Alvarado from UCSF that this happens here in San Francisco because people in the county hospital, patients don't want to travel every day to receive radiotherapy and choose a mastectomy instead. And this happens in Denmark, in Australia, in many other parts of the world. So that is the clinical reality. But what is the scientific rationale for Target? This started paradoxically in, a multi, in the whole organ analysis of mastectomy specimens in which we analyzed where other cancers might be present when a single tumor was seen clinically and radiologically. And what we found is that breast cancer is frequently multicentric. So if you see the green dots, that is where all the multicentric cancers are present when the tumor is pre present only where the scar is. But paradoxically, most recurrences occur around the tumor as the red dots, and if they occur in other parts of the breast, they are at a similar rate as they occur in the other breast. So it did make sense to focus radiotherapy to the tumor bed. So this was a, the concept that we give radiotherapy only around a tumor and avoid radiating the breast and any other organs that it inadvertently does, and finish radiotherapy immediately after lumpectomy under the same anesthetic. So based on this concept, we developed a new radiotherapy device and the target technique to bring this to the clinic. And over the last so many years, we have validated it in over 30 centers in more than 11 countries. So the technique is a, involves a machine, which is an electron generator and accelerator, which accelerates electrons along this t tube and generates X-rays the, at the tip of this tube. There's a spherical applicator, which is inserted in the tumor bed, and it gives a uniform dose of radiation to the tissues immediately next to the tumor bed which are at higher risk of getting local recurrence. It can be run in a normal operation theater. And so we did the first case on 2nd of July 1998, and that's how the patient lies on the table. That's the machine inside the breast, and that's the tumor bed. You choose the correct size of the applicator between 2.5 to 5 centimeters in diameter, and you insert it in the tumor bed, and make sure that you have got good clean apposition of the tumor bed to the applicator surface. It can be done in a normal operation theater, the machine is mobile, and it typically takes about 25 to 30 minutes to give the radiotherapy, and overall about 45 minutes added to your operating time. It is different from the Elliott technique in that here the radiation is given from within the breast and does not require any dissection of breast tissue, whereas with the Elliott technique, one requires dissection between skin and the breast tissue, and breast tissue and chest wall, which perhaps might be causing some deoxygenation of tissues, and it may reduce, perhaps, the efficacy of radiation, which doesn't happen with target. These are soft x-rays. The volume of tissue receiving high dose is small, and the dose corresponds to the density of tumor cells. So it is not typical of a normal radiotherapy in which all the target volume gets all the dose, but as the number of tumor cells, the frequency and the density is highest near the tumor bed, and the recurrence rates are highest near the tumor bed, you get the highest dose there, and it reduces as you go further away from the tumor bed. So that's the tumor cell density, and that's how the dose reduces as well. The patient recovers very well after the operation, so we published how to do this in, back in 2002, the first results of the pilot data in 2001, the and we published later on in 2004, 5, 6. 
An important point is geographical miss, which is when radiation to the tumor bed may be missing the target, and it is known to happen in many cases, although there are now methods of trying to avoid this. And of course, with target, you're giving it to the right place at the right time, and the time, the temporal miss, which normally occurs with any radiotherapy, is, we think, perhaps important. And the timeliness may be important because after wound, after wounding, there is wound fluid that collects in the wound. And this wound fluid we found, when we put it on breast cancer cell lines, stimulates proliferation, motility, and invasiveness. But what was the good news is that if you take wound fluid in a patient who has received target, the wound fluid did not stimulate these cells. So if you see the cells moving around here, these are tumor cells stimulated by the wound fluid, normal wound fluid, whereas if the patient has received target, then that wound fluid doesn't stimulate the cells. And this was published in clinical cancer research in 2008. And it is perhaps because of a change in the tumor microenvironment that is induced because of radiation. So it doesn't just kill cancer cells, it also makes the environment not conducive to growth of tumor cells. So it may be superior. So in 1999, we wrote the protocol, gave it a name, and planned recruitment of 2,232 patients. This was the International Steering Committee and the Data Monitoring Committee. We had a broad inclusion criteria, age more than 45, tumors less than three and a half centimeters, and we excluded lobular cancers. Remember, this is not a re randomized trial of localized radiotherapy versus whole breast radiotherapy. It's a trial of risk-adjusted radiotherapy versus one-size-fits-all radiotherapy. And one-size-fits-all radiotherapy is a standard treatment, and the experimental arm received a single dose of target and received external beam if, postoperatively, the patient was found to have additional risk factors that made us uncomfortable about this patient's local control. We expected this to happen in about 15% of patients, and we were right on target. It was a non-inferiority trial, and the patients could be randomized either before excision, and that was called a pre-pathology group, and then receive their radiotherapy at the time of the lumpectomy. A second group who already had lumpectomy or excision could also be randomized, and for those patients, if they were randomized to target, they had the wound opened and given radiotherapy. The trial's original recruitment was 2232 patients, started in 2000, and in April 2010, we recruited from 28 centers in nine countries. These patients were generally good prognosis patients, but remember, 82% were younger than 70. They were not elderly patients, and 64% patients were more than one centimeter in size. The two groups were well matched in terms of their characteristics. There was no difference we found in the extent of surgery. There was no major difference in any complications, apart from a small difference that we found in the seroma needing aspiration, which was countered to some extent by increased radi radiotherapy toxicity in the EBRT group. And you probably have seen these results in which we found that the local recurrence rate at four years was very similar in the two groups. And when you see a Kaplan-Meier plot, you can see that the two lines almost overlap, and we feel we established non-inferiority with a difference of 0.25% and the upper confidence limit of 1.5% at four years. This was published in The Lancet in 2010. We received some very good editorial, and Lancet put it on their front page, saying that these are selected patients should get this treatment. And we looked at ASTRO guidelines to see if how Target behaved in view of the ASTRO guidelines, and we analyzed according to ASTRO guidelines. And lo and behold, only 700 patients were suitable according to ASTRO guidelines, and 911 were unsuitable. And how did the results of the trial fare based on ASTRO criteria? We found that the difference between the two groups was very similar in every one of the ASTRO groups. Whether they were suitable, unsuitable, or cautionary, the difference between the two groups was very similar and small and cross zero. As you can see in this graph, this is the difference between target recurrence and EBRT recurrence, and in every one of the cases, it crosses zero. 
What is interesting is the pragmatic design of the trial in which in suitable group, hardly anybody received external beam, whereas 27% of those in the unsuitable group got external beam. So you know that about three quarters of patients in unsuitable group got only target, and overall, they achieved a similar local recurrence rate. So we believe that target delivers truly individualized radiotherapy, risk adjusted to the patient's risk factors. Professor Wenz, who is in the audience from Germany, their, their group has done quality of life analysis in which we find there is less pain, fewer breast symptoms, and significantly better patient satisfaction. We found that it causes less pain, and what is important in today's climate, that it saves money. Dr. Alvarado has estimated that in the next five years, if U.S. does not adopt Target, it would cost U.S. economy $1.4 billion. Now, that is up to everybody to decide whether it should be implemented or not. Now, this has received a lot of publicity in various newspapers, but most important one was in St. Gallen, when a panel of 52 experts suggested that in selected patients, partial breast irradiation, into bracket, intraoperative radiotherapy could be given a standard treatment. Now, what is an update for now? I'm going to give you a trailer and ask you to watch the space. We continued randomization after April 2010 because we were waiting and we were cautious while we awaited future follow-up. And the only ethical way was to continue randomization. So that was how it was in 2010. We continued accrual, and now we have 2,000, 3,451 patients when the trial closed on 25th of June 2012. The data lock was on 20, so this is a large trial. One trial, two treatments, 11 countries, 12 years, 33 centers, 42,000 forms, and more than 1 million data fields. Now, between 29th of June and now, I have slept for about two hours on an average in a day. And that is the number of patients. We have a large number of pre-pathology patients, which is the way it was originally intended. We have a good follow-up, 93% adequate follow-up. 1,000 patients have at least four years follow-up. 600 patients have at least five years follow-up. We are analyzing according to primary outcome of ipsilateral breast recurrence and survival, breast cancer survival and non-breast cancer deaths. We had hoped to present these data today, and I was very eager to present it. However, we are still digesting the analysis and we do hope to present it in the very near future. Please watch the space. But in the meantime, the target boost, when used as a boost, we feel that in young patients, local control is still inadequate, and our initial 300 patients pilot suggests that when you give the intraoperative radiotherapy as a boost, in addition to whole breast radiotherapy, the local recurrence rate is half of the expected perhaps because of the reasons that I've given before. And therefore, in St. Gallen, people felt that this could be used as standard treatment already. But we believe that it might be superior, and therefore we are about to launch the Target B trial to prove superiority of intraoperative boost compared to normal standard external beam boost. Now that the trial is closed, we are faced with the question, what do we do if I have a patient in front of me? And which patient should I choose? How do I select patients for target? In simple words, cautiously. They should be eligible for the target A trial, more than 45 years of age, suitable for breast cancer surgery, preferably grade one and two, and ER and PR positive, and definitely tell the patient that you may add external beam in about 20% of patients if there are positive margins, lymphovascular invasion, nodes, or unexpected lobular cancer. Hopefully, we are moving from vision to reality of risk-adjusted radiotherapy, where low-risk patients will get target as the only treatment, which may cover about three-quarters of our patients that we see in the clinic, and high-risk patients get target as a boost, reducing their local recurrence rate. Thank you very much.
I'm presenting on behalf of a large cohort of authors and trialists, target trialist group. The scientific rationale for target comes paradoxically from a pathological analysis of mastectomy specimens in which we found that breast cancer is frequently multicentric, but most recurrences occur near the primary tumor, just as they might, and very few in the other quadrants as they would occur in the other breast. So we felt it would make sense to give radiotherapy only to the area around the primary tumor. We collaborated with industry and developed a technique called targeted intraoperative radiotherapy, which is in short called target. It uses a mobile machine used in a standard operating room, delivering physical dose of 20 gray at the tumor bed surface over 20, about 25 minutes. The first case was performed in UCL on 2nd of July, 1998. The technique uses a miniature electron generator and accelerator, which accelerates electrons along a 3.2 millimeter tube, which strike a gold target to generate X-rays, which are modulated by a spherical applicator placed within the breast to give a uniform dose of radiation to the tissues at highest risk, such that the dose corresponds to the tumor cell density. Some translational work appears to support what we're trying to do. When you operate, you find the wound fluid collects in the breast wound. And this wound fluid stimulates proliferation, motility, and invasiveness of cancer cells in the laboratory. And what we found is that if you take wound fluid from patients who have received target, this stimulation is abrogated. Therefore, we felt that target might be creating an environment, a microenvironment that is not particularly conducive to tumor cell growth. Therefore, perhaps improving what we might, its efficacy compared to what the dose that we are going to give. So the target A trial included patients over the age of 45 with unifocal invasive duct carcinoma, but with no MRI that was required. Only 6% of patients in the trial had MRI performed. The size, we said, should be preferably less than 3.5 centimeters, and patients were randomized to two policies. Let me reiterate, there were two policies comparing the standard policy of fractionated external beam radiotherapy as per local policies, and the second policy was the risk-adapted radiotherapy, giving single-dose targeted intraoperative radiotherapy with intrabeam, and if postoperatively high risk factors were found, there was a facility and a strong recommendation in the protocol to add external beam radiotherapy. We expected this to happen in about 15% of patients, and in reality, we got to 15%. Between 2000 and 2012, 3,451 patients were randomized from 33 centers in 10 countries. The trial started in Europe, but it was very much an international trial with participation from Australia and North America. The patients, although the criteria for entry were wide, the patients who actually entered the trial were good prognosis patients. However, they were not just elderly patients. We had over 1,200 patients who were younger than 60, and there was a substantial number of adverse prognosis patients in the trial. For example, there were over 500 patients who were node positive. The maturity of the trial can be assessed with these figures. We have in the trial 1,222 patients with a median follow-up of five years, over 2,000 patients with a median follow-up of four years. The completeness of follow-up, you can see from the bottom half, the red line is the expected follow-up, and the blue line is what the actual follow-up is, showing that they are very close to each other. And 94, nearly 94% of patients were seen in the previous, were seen for at least five years or in the preceding year. These are the outcome measures I'm going to show. The primary outcome was ipsilateral breast recurrence with a predefined non-inferiority margin of 2.5% absolute difference in local recurrence. The secondary outcome were included death, which is what I'll present today, and the cause of death being breast cancer or not breast cancer death. We also explored 
Local regional recurrence, all recurrences that includes breast, axillary, contralateral, and distant recurrence, although this was not our primary endpoint, and also distant recurrence. So the next slide is the main is an analysis, is, to, is the method to show how we defined pre, pre-specified subgroups in terms of timing of randomization and target delivery and PGR status as a predictor of radiation sensitivity. So we subgroup patients according to timing of randomization. If randomization occurred before lumpectomy, they were called pre-pathology or concurrent target. And if when timing occurred after, randomization occurred after lumpectomy, and they, they had target delivered as a subsequent second procedure. We subgroup patients according to the PGR status as a surrogate for hormone sensitivity because the Oxford overview suggested that radiotherapy appears to be more effective in hormone-sensitive tumors. So in these graphs, the red bar shows the recurrence without radiotherapy, and the reduction in radiotherapy is seen by the light pink bar. And as you can see, in the lower graphs, which are hormone-sensitive tumors, the reduction is significantly more proportionately compared to ER-negative tumors, or hormone receptor-negative tumors, where the effect of radiotherapy appears to be small. As we had very few patients who were ER-negative, only 7% in the trial, we felt we, should, we could use PGR status as a surrogate for radiation sensitivity, and we, se- we decided this before the trial was unblinded for this analysis. So ER-negative patients include ER-negative, PR-negative, ER-positive, PR-negative, and any HER2 PR-negative. So we had four predisposed subgroups according to timing of randomization in the vertically and according to PGR status or radiation sensitivity horizontally, with the largest subgroup being 1,625 patients. These are the main results. And please concentrate on the color of the lines. Blue line is target, red line randomized to EBRT. Above is the primary endpoint of local recurrence. You can see there is a difference of 2% between target and EBRT. But the lines are reversed in the bottom graph of deaths. There are many more deaths than local recurrences. And we can see the target patients had lower mortality than EBRT, reaching a level of significance just about 0.09, with a hazard ratio of 0.7. Now, I will drill down this result according to the subgroups, firstly for the primary outcome and then the secondary outcome. In terms of the primary outcome, we explored whether this difference made a difference in local regional recurrence. You can see that the local regional recurrence is mainly difference is driven by the ipsilateral breast recurrence, and it is not seen in the largest subgroup of pre-pathology PGR-positive cases. Similarly, all recurrence difference is also driven by the difference in ipsilateral breast recurrence, and there is no difference in the largest subgroup of pre-pathology PGR-positive patients. Thankfully, we have found no difference in distant recurrence in the whole trial, or none at all in the pre-pathology PGR positive cases. In terms of the ipsilateral breast recurrence, the primary endpoint, we found that most of the difference arose in the post-pathology when target was given as a second procedure, or those who were progesterone receptor negative patients who were less sensitive to radiation, so the smaller dose may not have been enough. And in the largest subgroup of 1,625 patients, if you see, there is no difference at all in the ipsilateral breast recurrence with a difference of 0.18 with a conference interval straddling zero. And in terms of death, there was an absolute difference of 3.1% reduced total number of deaths with a borderline level of significance of 0.08, a 3.1% absolute difference with a hazard ratio of 0.6 and a p-value of 0.08. In order to drill down what the cause of this reduced mortality in target is, we looked at the deaths. There were 88 deaths, 36 of them were from breast cancer, and there was no difference at all between the two groups in terms of breast cancer deaths. But in terms of non-breast cancer deaths, we found a highly statistically significant reduction in mortality 
in patients that were randomized to target. And that this difference was quite large, and we wanted to find out why this difference was present. So we had independent assessment of cause of death by somebody, a senior clinician, who did not participate in the trial or did not know the randomization. And what we found is that the non-breast cancer death difference was driven by hugely reduced cardiovascular events and deaths from other cancers, with a hazard ratio of difference between 0.47 with a p-value of 0.0086, and a difference of between 1.4% to 3.5%. So in conclusion, in terms of the primary endpoint, the absolute difference in ipsilateral breast recurrence between target and EBRT for the whole trial unselected is 2%, and for pre-pathology PGR positive, the largest subgroup, it is 0.18%. In terms of the secondary endpoint of death, compared to target, th compared to EBRT, target, we found results in significantly fewer non-breast cancer deaths, leading to a trend in reduced overall mortality. So how should one select patients for target? I would say cautiously, patients should have all the fulfilled criteria for entry into the target A trial. And currently, we feel our preferred option is to use target at the time of lumpectomy concurrently and choose PGR-positive patients. We must add external beam radiotherapy if adverse prognostic factors are present in about 15 to 20% of patients. We believe that these new data will significantly improve the choice and for patients and their clinicians to improve their individualization of local treatment for breast cancer. Acknowledgements are due to all the centers, all the investigators, and all patients and their families who participated in the trial. Thank you very much.